This panel is called Symbiotic Earth, the Institutional Organism. And this panel takes as its starting point Lynn Margulis's endosymbiotic theory in which she researched microorganisms, so that's algae, bacteria, yeasts, fungi, and their ability to cooperate as a principle for the emergence of new species. Lynn Margulis was an evolutionary biologist who is largely credited as a pioneering mind in the development of the concept of symbiosis and evolution. She radically subverted the preeminent Darwinistic biological thinking at the time of survival of the fittest. And so we have congregated this panel to consider how it could be possible, like Lynn, to move away from the degenerative conceptual model defined by Klaus Quedenbrau yesterday as that of business as usual, greed is good, hypercapitalism, everything that's essentially burning us all out to adopt a sustainable approach, or even better, to go towards a regenerative, ecosystemic approach to institutional practice from a materials, architectural, social, and curatorial perspective. And so I'm delighted to, invite, to introduce you to our interdisciplinary panel of thinkers, who I'm sure have the answers to this brighter future. So first off, we have Kim. Kim Crackson is a conservator of modern materials and contemporary art specializing in sustainable practices in the art sector. Her area of expertise and primary focus in the field of sustainability is mitigating the environmental burden of materials and methods in art production, exhibitions, and fine art shipping. At Key Culture, Craxon is the director of materials at the helm of the Materials Key Book, an online sustainability guide for practitioners and cultural heritage. Craxon is an environmental advisor to Gallery Climate Coalition and a founding member of the GCC Berlin. And so Kim is going to go first and just give you a little structure of how this panel is going to operate. So everyone will have a 10-minute presentation, quite speedy, and then we're going to have a short Q&A at the end. And then I will invite you to go to Stamtish and we'll have a kind of conversation, hopefully over a drink. So yeah, I'm first, delighted to introduce you to Kim. Thank you so much. Is this, is this on? Yeah? Okay, it's on now. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, I'm so delighted to be here today. Um, I'm going to be speaking about networks of care and the circular economy. Um, so networks of care is a concept that I stole. No, I'm borrowing, I'm borrowing it from, from the, um, the healthcare uh, sector and also um, conservation of time-based media and digital media. And it's rooted in sort of this concept that the care for a person or an object or a digital media artwork needs to be distributed among um, varied specializations. Um, so it requires interdisciplinary action to provide care, and maintaining the network is additionally a focus of care. Um, we can go ahead and, and, and start, start this off, thank you. Yeah, so extending this metaphor then to the climate crisis, so we previously worked in silos in the art sector. Institutions, museums, galleries, artists, Everyone functioned as independent entities, um, and then also in tackling the climate change, we are still continuing to do so. But we require a collaborative interdisciplinary approach for the paradigm shift and systemic change necessary to reach the goals that are set forth in the, um, in the art sector from the GCC, for example, which is a minimum of 50% reduction of carbon emissions by 2030 and promoting zero waste practices. Uh, and a vital aspect of networks of care is transparency. So the network only functions if information and resources are readily exchanged and also accessible to everyone. So fostering and maintaining a network that operates transparently then becomes very crucial um, in this concept of networks of care. Um, you can go ahead and switch to the next slide. So, Oh, great. So, um, in the GCC Berlin, um, of which Helen is also a founding member, um, we established ourselves in 2021 as a branch of GCC International following a principle of collaboration uh, with the view that although environmental problems are global, solutions are often linked to local resources. Uh, one of the main aims of GCC Berlin is building networks within arts and cultural sector um, and engendering collaboration among interdisciplinary art professionals and organizations to better organize, share resources, and educate one another to bring about systemic change and mitigate the environmental burden of the art sector. So after a brief hiatus um, to establish our Verein status in Germany, GCC Berlin has relaunched as an independent nonprofit. 
Uh, and as part of our initial campaign, we were trying to move the Berlin art sector towards zero waste by implementing the circular economy. Uh, GCC Berlin has teamed up with Barter Art, which is an online material sharing platform, to feature Berlin as a hub city on their website. So before we talk about Barter Art, um, I think we should dig into what circular economy actually means. Um, so, oh, sorry, next slide. So we need to, oh, go back on the slide. Um, so it's, it's best to start off with our current global economy, which is not circular, so it's the linear economy. Um, and in the linear economy, we take materials from the earth, make products from them, and eventually throw them away as waste. So the process is linear, as you can see here. So using an example of a cardboard box, to make those boxes, trees were harvested, farmed and harvested, or they were manufactured from hopefully recycled paper. And then um, the trees are processed with chemicals into the finished product, which is to say the cardboard box. And then this requires energy, water, uh, yields pollutants, and then after it is shipped to a distributor, bought by a consumer and used for its purpose, um, it's often discarded as waste. Uh, hopefully in a recycling bin, but still, um, it's a single-use product often. And in the circular economy, next slide, please. In the circular economy, uh, nothing is waste. In a circular economy, we stop waste from being produced in the first place. Um, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is the leading voice in the circular economy, defines the circular economy as based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use, and regenerating nat natural systems. So the circular economy requires large-scale systemic changes in our approaches to design and material recovery. Um, it is often cited that in the circular economy, waste is a design flaw, um, but waste is also a byproduct of rampant consumerism. Um, let me switch the... But when we talk about the circular economy, the next slide, um, there's actually two cycles at play, the biological and the technical. In the biological cycle, it entails manufacturing materials with products from natural renewable resources that will biodegrade back into biological nutrients at the end of their working useful lifespan, um, thereby replenishing the earth to uh, continue the cycle. The technical cycle entails keeping products in use for as long as possible, as well as manufacturing products that can be disassembled and their parts reincorporated into the production of new products. Um, so taking the cardboard box example again, in the biological cycle, you could use a material such as mycelium, which is the tubular filaments of fungi. Um, it has a negative carbon, carbon imp uh, footprint, um, and it takes 90 days to completely biodegrade in soil or water and replenishes the soil. It adds nutrients to the soil. So that would be an example of a, a material to use as a replacement in the biological cycle. In the technical cycle, you would use a potentially repurposed metal or, dare I say, plastic um, that's robust, um, modular, and can um, you can exchange out parts that are damaged to keep the products uh, in circulation for as long as possible. So this is another illustration. The next slide, please. Um, yes, this is another illustration of the circular systems. Um, you can go ahead and skip to the next, the next slide as well. So in the technosphere, which you see over here, uh, the ways to eliminate waste are through sharing, maintaining, prolonging, reusing, redistributing, refurbishing, remanufacturing, and then recycling materials. Um, so in this tech, uh, technosphere cycle, um, all materials are kept in circulation through reuse, repair, remanufacture, and recycling is the very absolute last resort. I know that we think of recycling as something that's you know, positive, but we want to actually recycle the very last thing that we should do uh, with our materials. Um, but as you can see also from the diagram, sharing products and materials is the foremost important impactful action one can undertake. Uh, so now we're gonna skip ahead, please. Helen, thank you so much. Um, to Barter Art. So Barter Art is now active in Berlin. It is a peer-to-peer -peer resource sharing tool for the arts. Uh, you can post any material or item, such as exhibition furniture, so lighting equipment, um, frames, plinths, vitrines, um, anything you can think of, even for art, like art, art production, we, you know, paint that hasn't been used entirely. Anything can go up there. There's an option to sell, trade, give away, or lend, which I feel we need to really emphasize as an option. Um, we have around 170 museums, 440 galleries, and 20,000 registered professional artists in Berlin. 
that is <laughs> the monumental amount of materials and, and items that, are, that could be in circulation. Um, so what I'm hoping to do this summer through GCC Berlin is to uh, encourage and maybe put a little pressure on some of the larger institutions and larger museums. They have warehouses full of plinths. They have warehouses full of, of, of items that they're not using for exhibition making um, that could be redistributed. It could all be redistributed to smaller galleries. Um, with the amount of, of materials that we have already existing in Berlin, there's not a need to purchase anything new. We could actually implement a circular economy um, with, within the art sector. I'm, I'm like, I'm, we just need everyone to use it. This is, this is, the, this is the key factor. We need everyone to, to sign on to barter art. Um, if you work in one institution, a gallery, if you're an artist yourself, uh, we need everyone's cooperation uh, completely across the sector. So, you know, moving towards a circular economy and sharing these resources and halting the list consumerism um, and the waste that comes along with it, um, for me, is intrinsic to the concept of networks of care uh, and something that I definitely think that is within our reach in Berlin. Uh, if you want to get to the last side. And here's a few more. Um, oh, this is oh, the example of barter art. Sorry. I, I forgot I just... <laughs> not interested. Can we click one more? This is just a little, little scroll through of some... Oh, wait. It should be, active, it should be a recording. Maybe not, maybe not. Oh, there we go. Yeah, some of the items that are, that are available, just as examples. So there's, there's plinths, there's crates, um, there's building materials, uh, there's packaging materials. I mean, any, anything really goes, but... Uh, we want to get to a point that anything that you could potentially need would you could find on barter art. Um, so sorry, just go ahead. <laughs> really sorry. Uh, and here's some um, additional material sharing um, platforms and organizations in Berlin. If anyone is interested, Material Mafia also has building materials, textiles, lighting equipment. Um, art Seco has a crate bank um, and like a take back system for crates and Circular Berlin is kind of like a repository. They have an ecosystem, which is a you know, snapshot here of not just, it's not just for the art sector, it's, it spans across all sectors. Um, yeah, so if, if anyone wants to, to can do have some further research, here you are. And uh, please keep up with GCC Berlin. We have a lot of things planned uh, in the next few months and years. So yeah, that's, that wraps it up for me. Fantastic, thank you so much, Kim. And next up, we have Jan Bolin. So Jan is a curator of design, architecture, and contemporary art. He's the artistic director of Atelier Luma, one of our partner organizations for the Sustainable Institution, an experimental laboratory of design in Arles, France. He was curator of the fourth Istanbul Design Biennale in Istanbul in 2018, and initiated Manifesto 9 in Belgium in 2012. Lastly, Bolin created the Lithuanian pavilion Planet of People at the Venice Biennale, Architectural Biennale in 2021. So I hand it over to you, Jan. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you for being here and thanking for inviting me. Uh, I'm Jan Bulle, uh, like I said, I'm uh, leading uh, Atelier Luma. Atelier Luma is part of... Oops. Uh, yeah, first of all, where is it? It's in the south of France, it's in uh, Provence. Uh, it's uh, near a uh, big natural park, the Camargue. Uh, there are also, uh, but it's mainly uh, part of uh, Luma Arle, uh, which is uh, a big uh, cultural institute. It's the, the first Gary building that you will see today, uh, probably, uh, and it's uh, a big site, a former uh, train, uh, train station railway uh, repair building and Atelier Luma at this moment, I don't know if the cursor is working, is in the last building uh, of um, the site. I will point it then with my finger. Here, there is Atelier Luma. I will elaborate on that uh, part. Uh, a bit more uh, in the conversation today because one month ago we have built our own lab with our own materials. Uh, Atelier Luma is uh, 
is interested, uh, it's a bio design lab uh, and we are developing bio uh, regional design practices. That's how we call it. Uh, we have developed many materials. We work together with a lot of designers and artists and so on. But uh, for us, the methodology is uh, the most important. Uh, you see here a map of the region with colored dots where uh, human resources and material resources get uh, connected. Uh, and with that map and with, that, with these findings, we start to uh, make connections, uh, implement them in the real world, uh, and uh, try to share and transmit this knowledge with other parts in the world. I will elaborate on that later in the conversation. Takes a bit of a while before the slides jump. So this was where we were uh, two years ago. My Ling was working there with mycelium. Um, we invite designers, they come uh, and they find things. Uh, in this case, Studio Klarenbeek, uh, Alge. We bring them together with uh, uh, biologists and other uh, disciplines uh, and out of that um, uh, we develop, for instance, biopolymers uh, and a project, a product becomes a, a lab, becomes a, a platform, becomes a community uh, and step by step we build that further. Uh, this is Sunflower. Arle is known for uh, the sunflowers of Vincent van Gogh, uh, but we are interested uh, mainly in the stems, in the, uh, the stems of uh, the sunflower, uh, because um, that gives uh, an interesting material that have acoustic uh, properties and can be kind of foamy uh, replacement of polystyrene foam. Um, it's not that what we really do, uh, developing only these materials. We are trying to develop the whole uh, supply chain. Uh, the machine that you see on uh, the right is the most important thing because it's, uh, it's another way of harvesting um, sunflower. So we are not interested just in... Um, many people are interested in the oil and the seeds of sunflowers we are uh, interested in the leftovers of agriculture and uh, make out of that uh, products objects uh, that can last for years i always like to show sheep europe uh, is on a mountain of wool uh, since COVID, uh, China is not taking our wool waste anymore. Uh, we don't have uh, um, our own wool. Uh, the, our wool is coming from New Zealand and Australia. And uh, together with uh, Studio Martino Gamper and the Atelier Luma team, uh, we started to dye uh, under value to, uh, wool, started to look for new applications because this wool is not waste as such, probably you cannot make a, a pullover anymore out of it. You certainly can do other things. It's not only thermic interesting, but also uh, acoustic and interesting, fire resistant. Uh, just working with rice, rice panels to replace foam, or using the leftovers of uh, olives. Uh, to make uh, profiles, and mix them with uh, uh, minerals, ochres, make these profiles that then become uh, chairs and stools. And that becomes finally an interior uh, that is completely uh, uh, produced in a, in a circle of uh, 70 kilometers around us. So today I want to tell a little bit more about Lotwit. Uh, I can only say please come to, to Arle and visit us uh, because then you really can uh, experience it. Helen had the chance. Um, we did that uh, project, it's 
2,000 square meters uh, renovation building together with BC architects from Belgium and Assemble uh, from UK. Uh, together we worked uh, three and a half years together on uh, a project that we called Lotuit, and which is one of the buildings on the site um, where we renovated uh, this building. Um, it's not just a building, it's more like an ecosystem. At the end I will uh, tell you also a bit more about that. It should flip, but yeah, that was too much of course. This is how the building looked and we used the building itself as a, as a mine. Uh, so we had to excavate the soil and we used uh, the soil itself uh, to make the new walls out of it. Here you see some prototypes. Um, you see some structures that we built it ourselves. We had the chance also by COVID to have longer residency um, of months. Uh, Yeah, we worked together for a uh, kind of rest and okay, again, we <laughs> uh, and we made literally architecture together. Atelier Luma as developer of materials, BC architects uh, working a lot with uh, ramped earth and uh, uh, bricks and assemble in uh, collaborative modes. All the designers that we and artists that are coming to Luma and Atelier Luma, there is only one condition. If they come, they have to collaborate, not with us, but with somebody in the region in order to create and develop uh, a project. So that's the only condition that uh, we put forward when they come. So they come for a couple of days, uh, they look around, they find something, and then we let them connect with the region itself, and that will be then later on implemented or used and uh, applied. We used the construction site also as a place of learning because these techniques of uh, ramped earth and all kind of uh, plasters that were done with algae and pigments um, is something that is not rocket science, but something that can be developed uh, together with, uh, in workshops with the public from students to contractors uh, over time. So it was a site of learning, a site of uh, exchange. And here you see some results, how it looks at this moment. We used uh, the leftovers of uh, the, uh, the roof tiles that were broken and they became part of uh, the floor. Of the terrazzo floor. This is how uh, the walls here are, uh, the whole building is isolated with rice. It's packed, the whole uh, outside walls are um, uh, uh, thermal uh, isolated and uh, with uh, uh, rice. And sunflower is sprayed on it uh, as a kind of acoustic uh, and flame, uh, flame retardant uh, element. All the, the materials had to be certified. Um, here you see some of the textile examples in the space. Sunflower acoustic panels and I think I'm at the end What I wanted to show is that also uh, I can tell you a lot about uh, the natural ventilation in the building and how the building is climatized without any air conditioning. That is really possible in the south of France. It's not uh, that difficult. You only have to design the building in such a way. Uh, but also we thought about uh, the water cycles, the gray and the yellow water cycles uh, go into the algae pond uh, there we grow the algae, we use the algae for our experiments um, and uh, we also uh, use that to feed the garden uh, with water. So the whole building is not only connected uh, with uh, the whole wider region, 
uh, with the human and the material resources that are around, but it's also uh, a whole ecosystem with uh, the climate, water and everything that is around it. Voila. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jan. And yes, I implore you all to visit Arl and uh, the Atelier because it really is the most outstanding example of how it's possible with enough ambition and drive to make hopeful change. So thank you so much. And next we have up Mailing Loco. Dr. Mailing Loco is an assistant professor at Yale University School of Architecture and Yale Center for Ecosystems in Architecture and the founder of Willow Technologies in Accra, Ghana. As an architectural scientist, designer, and educator from Ghana and the Philippines, her work focuses on the design and integration of just biogenic material practices across the agricultural, agri architectural, and textile sectors. So thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm just waiting for my slides. But while we're doing that, um, the title of my talk today in relationship to the theme burnout is called When Burnt Out, Find a Way to Return Home. Um, and I was thinking about home not so much as a private asset or a retreat um, from the world, but rather a more expansive public sense of the idea where one does not have to retreat anywhere or hide from anyone or anything but really a way of being present, being familiar, safe, and most of all responsible within a public cycle of justice. Um, mainly because I think justice is what love looks like in public. Um, so I guess I'll uh, just talk while my slides are not here. Is it, is it coming through? Okay, all right, give me a sec. So anyway, I've been thinking about um, the relationship between our value system and justice, and really what are the ways in which we extract value from the land? Um, how do we transform it with different systems of labor? Um, and how do we make that value exponentially beneficial to all sorts of actors? And where does that value accumulate at the end of our material life cycles? Ah, fantastic, we jumped right to it, okay, great. Um, and to a large extent, uh, if we look at the major economic and political systems that have emerged over the last three centuries, what capitalism and socialism have in common is this top-down extraction, this model of ownership that impatiently extracts everything from the land or our ecology and sequesters that capital um, with people who own, um, whether it's the means of production um, or a corporate entity and other actors throughout the entire framework get very little of that value. And materially, we see that at the very end as what people called waste, right? Materials that are in the wrong place at the wrong time or we haven't found a use for it. And um, the system is predicated on alienating um, actors from each other so that value can be controlled. So whether it's us um, in terms of not knowing who or what goes into the things that we use, or all of us being alienated from the land or waste that um, takes a long period of time to return safely back into the ecology. And we can see this in many different forms, monocultures, um, farmers or factory workers who get very little for the value they contribute to um, larger material economic cycles. Um, and of course, um, textile, agricultural, plastic, um, waste, many examples we've heard, heard about today in the first two presentations. And a lot of my work is really trying to occupy the underbelly of that system. Um, and for us architects that have typically occupied that position um, in between consumers and owners and driven that, ex that extraction cycle even more strongly, we've got to find new ways of operating um, with this new resource essentially as waste, as well as with new actors who haven't traditionally been part of this material economy. So I wanna talk about just three projects um, that cut across a range of um, co-products. Maybe that's a better way of calling those materials as opposed to waste. Um, and the, through three steps. And, and the first is called taking the load off. 
And most recently, I saw this in the work of our fantastic partners in Accra, Ghana. Ghana is the world's second largest importer of secondhand clothing. And a lot of that uh, clothing is becoming poor, poor, poor in quality. Um, and a lot of that secondhand clothing is sold in the markets, typically on the top of um, women's, young women's heads, as you can see in this photo here. And the toll, the burden actually um, gets transferred onto the actual spine of these women. When you're carrying more than half your body weight, um, you begin to do damage to the human body, um, you know, trying to transport that through um, the market. Um, but it also comes in the form of these large-scale waste. Um, I, I work a lot with agricultural byproducts. Um, most of my research came out of looking at the extreme quantity of coconut husks that are a byproduct of the coconut boom. Everybody loves coconut water, coconut oil, coconut butter, all of the above. Um, and the byproduct is this really bulk, dense husk, which is found on the roadside. And typically, it's illegal in Ghana to dispose of this in the municipal waste systems. There's literally nowhere for these materials to go because they're so high in density that they actually end up ruining compactor machines, which is not so dissimilar with, with, with what happens with secondhand clothing. And so what begins as a land pollution problem very quickly becomes an air pollution problem because they have to burn this in open air at night in the city. And so looking at the husk and thinking about all of the value, if you can imagine what the husk has to do in the first life of a coconut, it's got to protect it from the sun, wind, high salt environments. All of that material intelligence is actually captured and it shows up if processed in the right way in a building material, for example. And so this is, oop, okay, is that not going back? So it's an example of an acoustic panel developed from coconut husk on the outside, bounded with a soy protein binder. Soy is a byproduct, again, from a large um, food industry. And actually on the inside of that is um, corn-fed mycelium. And this is an example of, I would say, a collaboration of different agricultural byproducts, uh, matching them to where they perform the best. So coconut's very good at abrasion and mechanical strength. The mycelium corn is super good at insulation makes the panel incredibly light and really reduces processing time to press it this way into sort of a Kit Kat. Um, this is an example on the right side of a chair made from shredded um, secondhand clothing made out of cotton, which was just made actually like two weeks ago by my students in Ghana. But very similar methodologies. First of all, take the load off the land and find other uses, high value uses for these materials. Um, and the scale of this resource is insane. Um, it's tied to our growth as a species. The faster that, um, uh, the more that we grow as a species, the more food we need and the more of this resource we're producing. We produce about 10 billion tons of these co-products every year. Um, they're grown for our food industry and about 40% of that goes into, um, is lost, sorry. And just to get a sense of how much that is, everyone always asks, is there enough? Uh, just picture 10 million blue whales cycling every year, a renewable resource of materials that we need to find um, better uses for. Um, and if we look at the world's largest uh, uh, produced crops, it's a very uh, dense diagram, but I just want you to focus on the first four because over half of everything grown for our food industry is either sugar, corn, wheat, um, or rice. And so the big four disproportionately control um, our agricultural sector. And if we were to scale up the production or the use of bio-based materials in those models, um, we will exacerbate some of the impacts we've seen, like biodiversity loss and a lot of the unjust labor systems that have associated themselves with the production of these, cro uh, these crops. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna try and skip ahead very quickly to the second slide. Um, one of the biggest things we're realizing is that the husk, any agricultural byproducts has a range of transformation pathways. It's always imagining a, a range of lives for these materials. Sorry, it's taking a bit of time. Uh, but it sort of ranges from the mechanically strong and the more filtration desiccant type applications. So you get really high strength 
uh, materials, things that are quite similar to oak in terms of mechanical strength that can come from a husk, or stuff that is actually light and fluffy, low density, very good at holding moisture or air particulates. So you can imagine this has huge implications for controlling humidity in a passive way in our buildings. It would be great in here in the summertime if it gets humid. Um, or good at really filtering all of the indoor air pollutants that come off our contemporary building materials. Um, and so this decision around which pathway is very much um, based on the quality of the crop and what the local demands are, because no coconut, no plant is ever created equal. And so beginning to uh, become a way to become plant uh, literate again is, is key. The second step is to find old friends who know the way. And maybe this goes back to a, a couple of the technologies both Kim and Jan were talking about. Um, looking at fungi, one of the most amazing kingdoms of life, that have been responsible for um, helping plants make their way from water to land and helping plants basically uh, grow and spread throughout land territories. Uh, today it also helps us break down the most complex materials in our environment. Um, and so they're an amazing collaborator for figuring out how to decompose some of our agricultural crops and also um, develop them or transform them into products like insulation. Um, the one thing I love about mycelium is there are millions of species and they're not fussy eaters. So there's a lot of agricultural byproducts that can participate within a biodiverse sort of economy. Um, all right, I'm gonna skip ahead since we're running out of time. But this is sort of the five-day transformation of mycelium eating, ooh, that's awkward. Uh, eating a uh, hemp, wow, this is, this, this clicker, all right, yeah, um, digesting a hemp curd, and uh, I work primarily with mycelium, not so much as to produce the, the, the actual objects, but to look at the ways um, this low energy, non-toxic way of transforming materials can be done um, in a very accessible way, so all you need is a sort of environment that can trap humidity, and this happens at room temperature. All of the food for the fungi is already within your agricultural byproduct. Um, and so figuring out ways to prototype this distributed participatory method of growing. This is a project in Liverpool, uh, an entire exhibition with urban farmers, uh, middle school children, about 200 participants growing a full tunnel in situ at Reba in, in the gallery itself. And that's sort of an example of the tunnel. Wow, this is going so fast. Okay. Um, one of the big things I want to say is there's good and bad ways to do bio-based uh, production. And you do this initially thinking, hey, you know, we're, we're coming up with something new. But you realize that the actual carbon footprint of using all these plastics, of refrigerating, um, uh, winds up making your, your final product even more high carbon than the conventional. And so really thinking about how do we make our mycelium base, our strains, even more biodiverse. We're prototyping with mycelium that grow in very specific areas around the world and eating waste that they would have been um, familiar with in their ecology is sort of the shift that we're trying to make in the work. And last but not the least, ah, uh, yes, Luma was a big inspiration for expanding the, the palette for the fungi. The last is to, to really partake in a home-cooked meal together. And this is sort of a metaphor for really thinking about um, how our cultural rituals and our social practices, everything we're expecting from the materials need to change. And how do we do that in a way that is desirable? And food has been an incredible platform for, for rethinking that. Um, so this last project I'm showing is a collaboration with a chef um, from Ghana, one of the world's top chefs, Lassie Atatika who's been championing indigenous ingredients. And um, in order to taste, uh, develop that taste and building that sort of social acceptance for indigenous rice, which has disappeared from the plate, um, we did sort of a large scale sort of public garden um, in a part of the, uh, the country's only remaining green park um, where flooding happened. And one of the most amazing things about the indigenous rice is their ability to be flood tolerant and deal with a whole host of, of contaminants that are already in urban water streams. So this um, sort of public park allowed people to be familiar again with rice they hadn't seen in centuries, it hadn't been seen in the landscape. 
Um, and they're also grown with sister crops, crops that um, like the okra, lemongrass, that are all important in terms of the ecosystem around the indigenous rice. And also developed a menu, um, which basically talked, I can't go through the whole menu, but it starts off with um, talking about all of the little ingredients, micro-ingredients that are part of the rice and coconut farming system, um, uh, which you'll see in a second. Um, in order to educate every um, dinner attendee who was part of the, the final dinner exhibition, so these were stakeholders along the value chain of the coconut and rice um, industry in Ghana, and also rethinking the way they could taste and um, identify all of these ingredients in all the meals. So this last meal is actually taking the waste product, the thing that we don't value at all, the activated carbon uh, coconut that's burnt, um, and infusing that into tiger milk and using that as a sort of sauce over a street food that is typically sold. It's called Kofi Brokeman. If you're broke, all you get is plantain and groundnuts, but it's transformed into Kofi Richmond. Very different taste profile, um, very luxurious in terms of in, in, enacting all of the sensory aspects of eating this meal um, in order to really transform how we, we actually appreciate these materials. So I'll end there, and thank you. That was Thank you. Thank you so much, Mei Ling, for that incredibly inspiring conversation. And um, just to see how possible it is to apply all that interdisciplinary knowledge is incredibly inspiring. So next up, we have Manuel Siroquai. And uh, Manuel is the, has been the curator at the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao since 2016. In that capacity, he has overseen major exhibitions such as Annie Alba's Touching Vision, Arch on my back, yeah, Architecture Effects, co-curated with Troy Terrien, Henry Michou, The Other Side. Siroquay has been responsible for the film and video exhibitions program at the Guggenheim Bilbao, including focus solo exhibitions by Amy Segal, Michael Snow, Yavia Tellez, Diana Tata, Alora and Calzadilla, Alex Reynolds, Jesse Jones, Sharon Lockhart, and Cecilia Bengolia. He currently oversees sustainability-related exhibitions and public programming at the Guggenheim Museum Bilbao. He is actively engaged in academia and has an extensive lecturing record internationally, having also served as an expert advisor to start the European Commission's Initiative for Science, Technology and the Arts. Thank you so much. So, hi everyone. Um, thank you. Thank you everyone at uh, EWERC for uh, organizing this. Um, yeah, so there are too many things I would like to say uh, today. So the idea is to give you an overview of the implementation plan for the advanced, uh, advanced sustainability strategy uh, at the Guggenheim Bilbao. Don't, don't, don't skip it yet. Well, since you did it, go for it. Um, but stay there for a moment. I hate not having the clicker. It's just like a, okay, a neurotic thing, you know. Um, the idea is that we're, we're going to change the focus because th this is not so much the like the general terrain of application of sustainability and regeneration strategies in a world in transformation that, as our colleagues said, I, th I really admire all the things that they are pushing for. But this is a, a specific space of application, which is a museum. So um, we have one thing in common with Iverk, which is that we're part of the Gallery Climate Coalition. And as an active member, which is a specific status, there are only four uh, art museums in the world that are active members. And this is related to the, how difficult it is to do it at, at such a scale and with the specificities of what museums do. Um, so there are several conditions. You have to be able to measure your carbon footprint entirely, have a green team. Um, help me, Kim. And Exactly. Yeah, and mission statement that is like public, yeah. So, um, to give you an, an idea, the first uh, food, uh, um, full measurement of the carbon footprint was made uh, from the data in 2021, so it was made in 2022. Uh, it's about 2,700 tons of carbon uh, produced by the Guggenheim Bilbao Museum. To give you an idea, this is I mean, a very large museum. The British Museum, uh, in the same period, uh, produced 5,800, uh, so more than double. And yet this is like very large. These are very large structures. A lot of energy goes into like climate control, protecting artworks. So some of the questions I would like to finish with today are related to what museums do and what they should be doing or how should we transform our own idea of museums and society um, 
for, for, for this to be realistic. Um, next slide, please. So this is an image of Bilbao. I don't know how much you can see, but Bilbao was an industrial town. The Guggenheim Bilbao Museum has 25 years of history. 50 years ago, Bilbao was a derelict post-industrial town, and 75 years ago, it was one of the largest steel producers in Europe. It had one of the most polluted urban rivers uh, in the world. Um, when the museum opened, it was not just a museum, there was like a, it, an extensive cleaning of the river, there was a new airport, uh, and the industrial port was moved out of town. There was a whole set of transformations, and that spirit has been kept for what's going on now. Next slide, please. Um, the idea today is that I will give you a, a sense of this. Um, the, the thing about the green uh, group inside the museum is what, of course, brought me to the conversation, but what I'm trying to convey to you is the result of the work of many people, and not just curatorially. Next slide. Um, but on the curatorial level, I would like to emphasize something which is going beyond the um, it's like awareness rising mission that museums seem to have as the only primary thing, which is basically image making about sustainability, climate change, the crisis. It's like, how can museums be something else? Um, so next slide. Um, I will give you an overview of all that is not curatorial uh, work, but you will get to see that this is all in progress. So for instance, for, for light, you know, it used to be, you know, like, you know, old uh, halogen light. It was changed to LED all over. Um, and that saves a lot of energy. But now what we're doing is trying to change to a dynamic system in which light is smart enough to consume locally. And, uh, you know, like for specific moments of the day when there's more light in a room that is, you know, like that has skylights and so on and so forth. Uh, for climate control, it's a little bit the same. Um, we managed to reduce the levels, but now we're lobbying for museums to have a, a more flexible uh, standard in climate control. You know, museums need to keep like uh, 20 Celsius a steady temperature and 50% of uh, humidity in galleries. Well, this is not exactly accurate. This is a good rule if you don't want to think. But in fact, what you have to avoid is like uh, drastic shifts in temperature and drastic shifts in humidity. So if you maintain a level that is like, you know, smooth and uh, then you can save a lot of energy because you don't need to be so cool in the, the, in the summer and so uh, warm in, in the winter. And so we're already doing this, but we're lobbying for this to become a standard. So when we get a, a, a very valuable artwork that is very fragile based on these standards, we can obtain the loan instead of someone saying no because you don't follow this and that. Um, then um, this is the, I cannot really read. Sustainable exhibitions. Okay, so... The idea is that, of course, we have to uh, start by reusing all that we have. So if we build for one exhibition, then we keep that, right? So, you know, in the film and video program, for instance, like some artists ask me for uh, a black carpet, you know, like it's very important for the sound and blah, blah, no reflection. So then we're going to keep that black carpet as much as possible, right? And so we don't accept anymore the idea, oh, well, this carpet is a bit shabby, you know, can you get anthracite, you know, because it's black, you know, and I, I fucking hate black, you know, uh, give me anthracite. So we're normally saying like, no. Antoset is good, you know, this, uh, this rally is good, you know, it's good for you, it's going to be good for the next, and it's going to be good for three exhibitions, and then we will need to do the work. And if we paint white again, we try to keep it as much as possible. But now we're changing to, like, well, if, do, if we do new construction, we will not use uh, the typical, you know, drywall. Now we're changing to cellulose, and we're working with a startup in Barcelona that builds cellulose. To give you an idea of how important this is and how uh, stupid humans uh, we are, um, you know, like a, a cellulose wall has a, has a lifespan of 10 years, but a, a, a normal commerce, a boutique, uh, has a lifespan, you know, average of five years. So, you know, like, even for sustainable materials, you know, like we're too fast. Um, we're also changing the, the type of paint, the type of paint we use, so it's not, you know, like, so uh, pollutant to produce it. Um, and we're recycling and trying to find new lives and collaborating with organizations around for the things that we haven't want to get rid of, but you know, not really use, use, useful or uh, sustainable. Next slide. Um, next, yes, that's it. So um, we're measuring the. The, the full carbon footprint because that's how you can reduce, right? You can be specific about what you're reducing. So now we are, you know, like um, already in like this extensive reduction, you know, like transportation, for instance, you know, when you have artworks from all over Europe, you try to concentrate the transport, not have one track per work. 
um, paper use, uh, so no leaflets, uh, new construction for temporary exhibitions almost zero, and in my exhibitions I, I try to do really zero. Uh, dependence on fossil fuels, the type of electricity we buy and so on and so forth. We keep pushing um, because this, you know, when you get a, a company that does renewables and non-renewables, you know, they, it, it's kind of tricky. Um, water consumption has been also, also reduced and uh, yet to give you an idea of the climate control reduction is there. So then now we have also charging posts for all staff cars. So we invite, like we pushing for the, st the staff to uh, get electric cars instead. Next slide. Now um, for the curatorial goals. Am I going too fast or am I running out of time or both? OK, good. So um, the idea is not, we, of course, we, we keep increasing awareness. Okay, there's a, there's a crisis that is in progress and we will just see worse and worse versions of it soon. But we also want to create impacts in social transformation that, and that, imp that implies being actively engaged in the uh, social aspects of projects. It's not just like getting the work, but also entering the process in which the works are made or the works are managed or the discourses are built. Um, the idea is to promote uh, transversal interactions between fields and therefore to, to, to create contaminations, to, to foster contaminations, so between art, science and technology, for instance, as fields, or forms of knowledge, you know, popular, scholarly, ancestral, non-human, etc. Um, and between disciplines, you know, like recently we had uh, people speaking about geophysics from the perspective of sculpture or, you know, choreography and uh, glaciology or uh, biochemistry and painting and so on and so forth. And then, of course, the, the question of leadership in our uh, plus D plus I, research, development, and innovation is like, well, but we are not an industry, but we can be the place in which certain ideas can be uh, sort of grown. And uh, that's where, you know, like the funds of a museum, I think, are best used. Next slide, please. So these are just some examples of the programs that have been happening in the past three years. Uh, these are some of the exhibitions. In all of them, there was a direct impact on the questions of sustainability, uh, public programming related to them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You will see some images. I don't have time to uh, give you the, the full description here, but I invite you to ask me about any of these artists later um, at the bar because every project had a specific I would say aggressive take on the rest of the program at the museum. So for instance, Mun both Munir Al-Kadiri and uh, the Autolith group happened at the same time as Motion. Motion was, you know, about the automobile history and art and architecture. Um, and so I tried to address uh, like the fossil history and oil mythologies and so on with Munira and, and, and the Autolith group. The Autolith group was about, uh, the work was about soil, but also about futurism as it was imagined from, you know, like India in the early uh, 20th century uh, uh, and, and by the poet Ramindran Tagore. Um, Material Life was a section of the big collection show for the 25th anniversary. Um, but you, actually, can you go through the slides just like um, on a, you know, sort of like um, calm pace, but continuous? Um, <laughs> and those are some of the symposia that we've organized. Um, what you see here are works in the collection. Stop here. Sorry. Um, um, you know, like the, the piece with the fog before has been there for 25 years. It's by Fujiko Nakaya, and she's one of the very first artists who worked with a scientist in, in producing a technology, not an artwork. And the technology was the invention of an artist that then used for artworks extensively. So she, she, she created pulverized water um, in collaboration with an atmospheric scientist. This is a work by Susana Solano, another artist in the collection. This dates from 97. And the beautiful thing is that it already addresses uh, plastic issues in the coast of Africa. She's an activist uh, in, in, in Burkina Faso, uh, in the Cote d'Ivoire, I mean, the best countries where she's done not artistic projects, but she's collaborated with the populations in these initiatives, and then the artworks were inspired by it. So this is, a, as you see, some sort of raft made out of plastic and steel. Next slide. Yes, I wanted to focus, this is good, it's fine. Um, go for it. Not that one. Yes, so this is a tree by Yoko Ono. Um, I'm very happy that we did this because this is a wish tree. She activates it, next slide, um, once a year, and people like hang their wishes. This is an, an outdoor piece, and I, want to I wanted to emphasize one fact by bringing it in indoors. We, we had a team of ecologists and people controlling the life and the stress of this tree indoors, but I wanted to emphasize in this show, which was material life, um, how much a museum is hostile to living beings and how museums are made for the inert and the lifeless. And I think that's really scandalous and we don't notice that. There is not one bug, there is not one single uh, spore in a museum. So changing that, I mean, sounds 
uh, fantastic from the perspective of re regeneration. As our colleague from no Institute yesterday said, regeneration is the next step. It's not sustainability. But in a place that is basically born and raised in the extractive colonial paradigm of European-centric uh, culture, well, first you need to start proving that, you know, like this is a space of friction, right? And then, of course, we're working on the next uh, stage, which is the last slide. But uh, please do one more. This is the uh, activated wish tree. Um, next. This is the Autolith Group's uh, work, O Horizon. O Horizon is a, is, a, is, a, is a layer of the soil in which the composition happens. Uh, next. This is Monira Al Kadiri, Holy Quarter. Um, Monira speculates about, you could see this piece, maybe a house der Kunst that was produced by them, and then we uh, got it after, after COVID. Um, she speculates about the mythologies of oil coming from a, like an alien origin, and also instigating some mythologies in the Quran. I mean, it's quite hardcore. Um, next. <laughs> because, you know, like, she comes from Kuwait, you know, so like her family, like, um, you know, her grandfather was, was a pearl diver. And then next is, you know, like, your, anyway, next. Next slide. So this is a whole prototyping uh, effort that we did with 15 universities in the framework of this uh, automobile show with Norman Foster. The idea is that we would project into the, like, the post-carbon futures end of the 21st century. And uh, we collaborated with a lot of uh, brilliant people in four continents out of the world. And um, the idea was that some of these prototypes could actually be implemented uh, much quicker and not necessarily by the automobile industry, but by mobility. So like, you know, um, interest in society uh, at large. Uh, maybe a couple more images. Yeah, this is the project that we did with the University of Cape Town, which was like the system, uh, I told you, Magling, about it yesterday, right? So yeah, this is a so like individual mobile system that can be assembled in like little worms for like a collective groups. Uh, next slide. And this is like a regreening uh, machine to reforest areas that have been desertified. Uh, it was a project from the uh, group of Umea University. Next slide. Yes, and this is from, I think this one is from Yale, actually. They, 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 they were very inspired by Nomadland, you know, and this idea that cities sort of like will be assembled and disassembled. It was a little bit of Burning Man, too, which is problematic. Anyway, next. Yeah, and this is a show uh, by UNE Crespo, we're, and we're preparing for uh, 2024. UNE works with, like, uh, I think, substantially anthropocenic material. So there's a lot of toxicity in the work, but also there's a lot of relationship to the body, and it's a constant friction between toxic elements, uh, new clean elements, and I think you are telling me that, yes. So, almost there. Okay, next slide. This is more UNE Crespo, and next slide. And this is Marine Gonier, we will be presenting this in October. This piece is made in Giverny, at the gardens where Monet did his famous uh, Nymphaeas. It's less known that it's a completely artificial garden that Monet built at the same time as he was losing sight. So it's almost like a, a, like a vision, lens kind of tool. And, um, and it's called Meadow Report, playing with the idea that it was made exactly 50 years after the Meadows report, which is basically the first report in which climate change was announced with catastrophic consequences. 50 years ago, you know, a, a computer that was not as powerful as an iPhone could already say, you know, you guys are not doing it right. Nobody listened. So therefore, it's still important to raise awareness. But there's something else to information, right? So last slide. Next one, yeah. More. Yeah, this is the site that is, as you see, an industrial site. It's uh, working at less than 10% at the moment. This is where the Guggenheim Bilbao is planning a new project in, will, in which we will not try to build sustainable uh, museum practices, but re regenerative and positive ecology um, through museum practices. So this is like more of futurable, but you know, I leave it there. Last slide. You know, four quick questions. What, are the, what is the sense of cultural preservation and how can we rethink the necessities of collections? So the question of transience. What is ex the expected lifespan of a museum and its collection? Centuries, millennia, geological time. So the more than human history is how can we sort of like reconcile ourselves with that? How can we reconcile exhibitions, programming, and large vegetation with ecosystem reparation and care? I mean, like, yes, you can do something amazing. Imagine, like, 300,000 people come see it and they ruin the landscape, right? Any of our projects could suffer from that. So. The world is not helping in, the, in that sense. We need, to, we need to know how to do it. So regeneration. And in which ways can a large institution practically connect with the goals it topically and thematically promotes? So going beyond representation. All right, that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Manuel. And sorry to rush you. We're going to have to get you back for a full hour. I think everybody on this panel. 
But um, no, it's fascinating and, uh, and it's very inspiring for me personally from EVERC because we try to implement all these changes into several different aspects of the institution, but as a kind of very powerful large institution like the Guggenheim Bilbao, you can really make this change and you can be really a spearhead in this, we hope. <laughs> so thank you. And last but very much not least is Julia Bellinetti. So Julia Bellinetti is a researcher and cultural programmer. Her interests lie in the political ecologies of contemporary art institutions, in particular with regard to processes of knowledge production. She researches this subject in her doctorate at the University of Amsterdam and in, in her institutional practice at the Jan van Eyck Academy. Here she runs the Nature Research Department and coordinates the Future Materials Programme, a multidisciplinary platform aimed at promoting and disseminating knowledge on sustainable materials for art and design practices. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, and thank you to the whole team here at EVAC for organizing this wonderful event. So I will try to add the further layer of reflection to the already very inspiring um, contributions and presentation of my fellow panelists. And I would like to stay with the idea of how material relates to the system of values that were already like tapped by previous panelists. Um, and especially like, so my starting point into the, my presentation is actually the idea that materials are not passive or not silent matter, but actually they speak about the system of values informing an institution and about how an institution relates to the modern human ecosystem it is part of. So in case this might feel quite abstract and conceptual, I would like to delve into an example to make it a bit more tangible and concrete. Next slide, please. Yes, so my example actually is this um, photo by um, Courtney um, Desiree Morris, um, artist and academic, and it's part of a series called Solastalgia. So I imagine that, uh, let's, let's, like, at first glance, this, um, this image might, might appear quite simple. So it represents like a cement foundation with um, edges on both sides. There is actually like, there is a road in the background, um, plants that are pushing through the cracks and s some trees that are rooted in the loam. Um, but actually, for the ones of you who are more familiar with the work of um, Carnine Desiree Morris, actually, uh, the, the series Solastalgia describes the slow violence occurring in her grandmother's community in Mossville, Louisiana, a community that has been forced to relocate due to the deadly um, level of toxicity released in the water, in the air, and in the soil of Mossville by the local um, um, well, plastics and petrochemical productions. But there is like a third reading that I would like to suggest to this image, and actually I'm tapping into um, an article by Ether Davis called uh, Plastic Media in order to suggest this. And it's actually like, so for someone with a more technical background, this, this image actually represents the result of petrochemical processes behind the medium of photography. And I'm talking about celluloid film as well as the chemical behind the um, process of development of negatives. But also, like, if we think about the shift from analog photography to digital photography, I'm thinking also about, um, well, the fact that plastic actually constitutes 17% of most of um, electronic devices, such as cam digital cameras or smartphones. But I'm talking also about the infrastructure supporting digital media as, for instance, the underground and underwater cable that are coated in plastic and that are like the invisible but still fundamental infrastructure supporting the internet. So, uh, next slide, please. So what I'm trying to suggest here is not really like a radical critique of how plastic is being used and it's, it's being used in, uh, in the arts, but it's more, um, what I want to suggest is more like, uh, is, is more to stress and highlight how actually oil and plastics are fueling and supporting our words of imagination, representation and arts. And actually how the, like, the materials that, um, that constitute artworks, exhibitions and um, and even the material infrastructure of art institutions themselves as a whole, not only bear witness with processes of social and ecological violence, but they are also uh, embedding uh, certain principles that point out to the common roots between um, the certain works of art, certain institutions, and these processes of ecological and social violence. And uh, so, like, 
as, as you can see here, like Steph Stephanie Le Manager argued how cultural artifacts and artworks are actually manifestation of what we might call uh, fossil cultures. And how actually the dependency of the art world on oil goes beyond the climate control of galleries, beyond the art transport, and beyond like travel that takes the art crowd all over the world for biennials and, and more. Um, so I think like in the context of this panel, I would like to stress how materials could potentially lead to, um, well, first of all, to acknowledge this entanglement, but also possibly to suggest and in, inspire like a reimagination in how we could potentially disentangle artistic practices and institutional practices from these systems of um, violence and destruction. Next slide, please. So, and this leads me to uh, present the project of today. So, uh, what I just argued before are like some of the questions and thinking behind the Future Materials program at the Jan van Eyck Academy in Maastricht in the Netherlands. So, I will go quite quick now because the time frame is uh, quite limited, but I'm happy actually to, you know, delve more in, into details about this program like um, during the Q&A or afterwards. So um, the Future Materials Programme aims to uh, support the ecological, well, the transition towards ecologically conscious art practices. And um, it's, like, it's, it's made by different components. The core one is the Future Materials Bank, which is an online archive of materials and material projects developed by artists and designers. These materials are either like natural, like natural dyes, circular, as some of the materials already mentioned today, or new materials, such as, for instance, inks that derived from carbon capture from the atmosphere. So they emerge from the intersection between science and art. Um, well, on the, on the website of the Future Materials Bank, we also have a lexicon and a material policy that are aimed at not really to provide a universal knowledge about what sustainability is, um, but it's more like to create, um, well, the lexicon, a common understanding about certain recurrent terms on the website, and the material policy more to guide practitioners who might want to submit their project, but also our team in order to, to go through and to make a screening of the project and an assessment. Next slide, please. So next to the, materi the Future Materials Bank, we also have, yes. Perfect, thanks. Um, so next to the Future Materials Banks, we have also like um, a physical dimension, an offline dimension at the Jan van Eyck Academy. This is like an image from the Future Materials Lab, where we have a small collection of material samples um, from, from the project um, of the Future Materials Bank. And this, of course, is like, um, would like to offer possibilities to people visiting us to, to have also like a more tangible connection with these materials, to uh, check their morphological properties, their like aesthetic effects, and and see how they react to humidity and how they could be implemented in different artistic practices. Next slide, please. Yes, um, and then the Future Materials Bank and the Future Materials Le um, Lab, so the online and the offline dimension of the project of the program are actually connected in the public program, um, which consists in the Future Materials Encounters, a program of workshop uh, that are built around the materials. So they are like encounters with the materials beyond, beyond the humans. So we, 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 we invite one of the practitioners from the Future Materials Bank to meet our community. And it's really like a moment of exchange around and through the material, both in order to share perhaps like more technical or hands-on approaches to a material, but also to have discussion and conversation about what, what these material mean in relation to our uh, connection to planetary landscapes or uh, planetary struggles. And next to this, we have more recently like um, welcomed some intervention from the artists in residence, and it's something I would really like to uh, continue, who are interpreting our uh, small collection of samples. And the image here is by uh, two current artists in residence, Kim David Bot and Sumugan Sivanesan, who uh, created their own uh, future material sound bank, which was a lot of fun. Next slide, please. So uh, something I would like to stress about future material is that um, it doesn't really aim to, um, to push for a linear transition um, in, in terms of like sustainability. So it doesn't want actually just to, um, to continue like with the example of the, of the beginning of my presentation, it doesn't want to substitute plastic, fossil-based plastic with bioplastic based on you know, algae bio-based plastic or many other kinds, because we realize that actually if we do not change our approaches to production and our pace of production, we just change the terms of the equation, but we do not change the equation, which is actually the problem, or at least we believe it's the problem. Um, so, like, we, we, 
what I'm going to present now is actually like two examples of how certain material projects that we have collected um, uh, might suggest really like other ways to uh, think, to practice and to engage with art in the context of single artistic practices, but perhaps even in the context of an art institution. So the first one is the one you can see here. It's, um, so this is like um, the practice by Claudie Jongstra, a Dutch designer and artist who um, lives and works in symbiosis with um, a botanical dye garden and a flock of um, rare indigenous sheep in the north, in the rural north of the Netherlands. So from the botanical dye gardens, she, um, she sources the pigments that she uses in her tapestries and from the flock of sheep, um, she obtains the textile fibers. But beyond these, let's say, non-human symbiosis modes, there are also like a web of human relations she engages with, which ranges from farmers, um, shepherds, botanists, but also historians. And I want to stress the historians because what she's also aiming to do is actually to preserve um, knowledges and crafts that might have that might be forgotten in the accelerated pace of art production or textile production. And this is actually like the, the, the principle I would like to stress in relation to her practice. How actually the temporalities of such a symbiotic mode of working um, reconnect with uh, more cyclical rhythms in tune with the natural, proce natural process of regeneration and, uh, and the seasonality of, of, the, of like, the modern human communities here. Next slide, please. I'll wrap up. Uh, so yeah, and this is like mycelium. Like this is like another example from mycelium, which was already like uh, quoted different times today, which is interesting. Um, and we, by this example, I want actually to tap into the uh, inevitable unpredictability of modern human collaboration. So as you can see here, this is like a block by the um, the design duo Quoduo. Um, and it's basically like they didn't really understand why. They just like followed exactly the same process of previous mycelium pieces, but it just like kept on growing and it eventually like sprout in mushrooms and fungi. And this is actually interesting because even the most meticulous designer might experience in their, or artists might experience in their practice uh, the fact that, uh, well, the, the unpredictability of uh, non human agency. And I think this is interesting, especially thinking about like the, the context of art institution and, and, and galleries to um, sort of reappraise our impulse to control, uh, to control process, to control form, and also to, prefer, to preserve form for an indefinite um, horizon of time, as it was already mentioned before. And, and here I'm tapping like into the separation between nature and culture and, um, and subject and object, but mostly nature and culture in the context of art galleries. And I think I'm like reaching the end of my presentation, so I hope to have respected the time frame. And, oh, next slide, please. Yes. Um, so yeah, I hope to have like actually demonstrated how materials might they do embed certain values, and how by using certain materials we might even really change the way we actually practice art and institution practice art in a deeper level. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you so much, Julia. I mean, incredible work you're also doing there. I don't think we're going to stay too much longer on the stage because I feel like I can sense a bit of thirst everywhere. So I think we're going to maybe move over to the Stamtish for the kind of continued Q&A session. But I just want to say a really, really heartfelt thank you to all and for all the incredible work you're doing and kind of ambitious and driven and determined. And please, please continue. And I just wonder how we can work together better to kind of implement change quicker. Um, I think Jan maybe said it once, and my partner Pablo constantly says that there isn't an energy crisis, this is a crisis of imagination. And sitting here, it's obvious there isn't, but how can we implement that on a political level and advocate and aggress to change quicker, I think would be perhaps an interesting starting point at the table. But thank you all so much. And please don't go too far, because in 10 minutes, we're slightly late. We're going to have Vanessa Andriotti, who's an incredible land, um, rights indigenous, sorry, land and indigenous rights activist and author, in conversation with Lucia Fitriosti, who is the head of ecologies at Serpentine Galleries, in conversation here. So in about 10 minutes, please do come back. Thank you very much.